This is Otto Neumann, a self-portrait as a comparatively young man, done, as you can see, in 1921. He was born in 1895, died in 1975. <coughs> he grew up in Heidelberg and um, he was, came from a family, and it's important to understand the family situation because it was a very stratified society. I mean, it was very hierarchical, you know, there was, there was titled people and so forth. His father was a professor of Romance Philology at the University of Heidelberg during its salad days when it was one of the most preeminent universities in the world. And uh, it, it sort of mattered. Uh, it's hard for me to remember teaching in Chicago that university professors actually had status at some point and people deferred to them, something I never experienced <laughs> myself, I'm afraid. But, <clears throat> but seriously, um, he moved in a very rarefied circle. All kinds of people were at the University of Heidelberg at that time, including people like Max Weber, who you may remember, depending upon your majors in school, as the author of The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, and he was also the architect of the Weimar Republic. So he was a noted professor there. Uh, there were people like Carl Jaspers, the social critic and philosopher. There were just all kinds of people in psychiatry. We're going to come across um, uh, a couple of them a little later on. Neumann, uh, so he grew up in that kind of family, in that kind of world where his father's colleagues be, were part of a social circle and an intellectual world in which he imbibed. <clears throat> when he died, his wife had already died, his only child was gone, and his estate came to the United States. His <coughs> and I'm jumping ahead to the end to sort of Brit then bring you back to the beginning, because that's how I got involved. His wife had been his next door neighbor, his, his second wife, he'd had a very brief marriage that ended up in divorce. And his next door neighbor's family owned a major department store in Heidelberg. If any of you have ever been there, the Hauptstrasse is the main enclosed mall. And that's where the university is and the museum. And at the top of the mall was a store which was then owned by them uh, until the Nazis came along. And he ended up marrying the daughter of that family, one Hilda Rothschild. Uh, neither set of parents were happy about this. Uh, his, her family, because she was marrying an impecunious artist who they didn't see making a living, which was nothing new. That would be the same thing for parents looking at their kids today. Oh, you're going to marry an artist? Or, you know, what are you going to live on? Uh, on the other hand, his family was not happy that he, she, that he was going to be marrying the daughter of a nouveau riche shopkeeper, a Jewish shopkeeper. But they got married. Her family supported them actually quite well for a while. They got married in 29. <clears throat> when he died, since her family had helped support them, the estate was essentially went to Hilda's brother, who lived in the United States. A brother and brother's wife and three sons had skedaddled here in 1938 for obvious reasons. Their work was brought to the home of one of the three sons of that brother. And because he lived in Highland Park and had a nice basement and was in a good location, the son who knew the artist the best lived in Boone, North Carolina, in the middle of the mountains. Not a good place to try and get an art collection out from. And the other one, who lived not far from uh, LA, <clears throat> but had a uh, career that didn't uh, really permit for this kind of work. So it sat there for a while. And then finally, uh, the, the nephew in uh, Highland Park 
contacted uh, the then uh, curator of prints and drawings at the Art Institute, Harold Joachim, who got him up to Highland Park somehow. And he said, you're a very important artist here. You've got to do something with it. He waited a while, and then he sent out a package of information and slides to the chairs of the departments at the University of Chicago, Northwestern, and my school. I responded. Uh, our sons were, I'm not sure how, maybe either of them could tell us, but I think 10 and 12 or something like that. This is about 1978, <coughs> 8 and 10, I guess, something like that. And we had sort of a teenage person saying, all right, you know, just give him lunch. So we called back, uh, give him dinner. We called back, uh, put him to bed. And we were there nine hours just going through this estate and blown away. And eventually, after a lot of back and forth and whatever, I ended up becoming the curator of that collection. Uh, though German art was not my field and my German was pretty weak, but uh, we worked it out. So I have been involved since then. We've had exhibitions in Germany, in the United States, with various dealers at various points. And now let's look at him. I just want to sort of give you that background of how I got involved. He, uh, was this, uh, he grew up in Heidelberg, and he, at that time, there was no such a thing as an art department associated with a university the way they are now. You had all freestanding art schools. We have some of those, obviously, now, too. But they were pretty much independent art schools. And he studied at several, in Darmstadt, and uh, briefly in Munich. Um, his education, though, was interrupted by World War I. His older brother, who was already a doctor, uh, was killed in World War I. He had started out looking at medicine, but that didn't, wasn't going to go anywhere. But he had been accepted to the university. And he decided, no, to really wanted to go work with the art. So he ended up getting a, li a little more instruction. And down at the exhibition uh, downtown, we have some of his cards and everything, his, his enrollment cards from his uh, institutions that he was studying at. But he came back to Heidelberg, and he really started doing portraits. He had, one of the teachers he had studied with uh, in one of the cities, at one of the art schools, had really admired his work. And he directed him, and he said, you know, you can do this. So he ended up doing portraits, including, as I say, this very nice self-portrait. Uh, next, please. Ooh, that's not what I was, I hope that I had a Kakashka there. Oh, you do, I do have that card there. I'm sorry, I didn't remember. So this is one of his uh, identification cards for studying here. This one uh, you can see <coughs> in Karlsruhe. And, uh, and we can see he was there right before the war. And then after the war, again, he ended up in a couple of the other cities. Next, please. Of course, while studying, one of the things that you did still in the academies that were traditionally organized, much as the way they had been in the, even the 18th and certainly the 19th century in Germany, was you studied from plaster or bronze casts of classical statuary. That's how you learned. You started out with your anatomy and things. Then you moved on to live models. So here, this actually says, uh, essentially, it's a, for antique plastic cast. So that's what he was drawing from. Next, please. And these are the kinds of portraits he started doing uh, after the war, again, in the late teens and very early 20s. An unknown woman. Uh, it has tremendous fluidity. Uh, and he clearly became very masterful uh, in painterly techniques. Next. This is the portrait of Max Weber. That actually still hangs at the University of Heidelberg. I don't, I've never been able to get a color image of it. I wrote twice, and I just never could do it. Uh, and it was just before he died. He died uh, as a very young man, actually. Next, please. Uh, this one, some of you have seen hanging in our place. 
Uh, this is, at first it was thought to be possibly Hilda's mother, might be. Uh, in any case, both this and the other ones show real influence. I just think I have a kakashka there somewhere. Do I? <laughs> I do, okay. Here's a portrait of a kakashka. That's who, among the German artists of that second generation of expressions that he was most uh, uh, identified with. He really liked, and actually, if you look, think back at that self-portrait, he is an O-N that's very much like the OK that Kakashka used on many uh, of his own portraits. So there's a very strong sense uh, of modeling and, and thick painterliness and so forth. And that's what he was doing in most of the portraits. Next, please. But he also looked to the other German expressionists. And one of the things we, they were both best known for was their either linoleum or woodcuts, very sharp and angular. And the people, especially in the first group, called the Bruche, the bridge, uh, Kirschner, and all, the, all these other artists uh, did this kind of work. And Neumann's doing these a few years later, 1921, 1920, 21, 22, uh, a series from the life of Christ. These are fairly small uh, linoleum cuts. The angularity and sharpness is, is very much there. If any you tried to do a linoleum cut when you were kids in school, you know how hard it is because it's so easy for the knife to slip. Oh, that's right. Okay. Here we have examples of them. But the, again, it's, it's, it's very hard because of the, you know, the texture of it to, to make curvy lines. So they tend to be very angular, which fit in with this kind of emotional kind of thing they did. <clears throat> so uh, the calling and uh, the Last Supper. And again, uh, we have a couple of his prints, not of these particular subjects, of these linoleum blocks on. Next, please. David, actually behind you is... Uh, oh, that's from that series. Here, <clears throat> the flagellation. One of the things that he did for, besides uh, the religious ones, and you could call those literary in a sense, if you want to say it's from the biblical source, he looked to a lot of literature for his subjects in his early years. <clears throat> and one of his major subjects was the Divine Comedy of Dante, which was an extremely popular subject for many artists in various countries in Europe uh, since the Renaissance. Uh, so you have just all kinds of people, from Botticelli on, doing this. Uh, probably uh, some of you uh, have seen you know, the ones done in the 19th century and, and so forth. So he set about to deal with the subject of Dante's Inferno. And he did a series of 34 drawings, one for each canto, each verse of the, divine, of the uh, Inferno. He did a handful, 15 to 20, uh, on some of which are up there on that wall from Purgatory, none from Paradise. You know, it's boring, you're going to sit around, playing a little, I mean, I'm never going to find out, that's for sure. But, uh, I, so I really should concentrate on this based on my lifestyle. Uh, but he did one drawing each. They were never produced in a book. They never became a book published. They were exclusively done as a series of drawings. They were done in vellum paper. Uh, they are incredibly detailed. And they change throughout the series. I can't even be absolutely sure. I'm not a good enough connoisseur to even really try and dope out which order they were done in. Because you can see some of them, the figures will become much more Michelangesque. Others, they're more narrow. And one of the things he does is he takes and tries to synthesize each verse, each canto, into the, into one drawing. Well, in the first canto, Dante is in these woods, and he goes this way, and he can't go that way because there's a leopard, and then he goes this way, and he runs into the lion, you know, three different beasts. 
Well, Neumann conflates them all together. So to get the whole gist of that canto in one you know, story, so in, in, one, in one drawing. He also, and we'll look at several of these, then went on and treated these subjects in various kinds of prints. But he never uh, dealt with them in one book. And if you, speaking of books, if you look at that uh, monograph that I wrote on him, discuss how various people at different points in the career kept on suggesting ways of doing a book or having him illustrate the book or where places they were shown. And they were shown several times in his lifetime in different exhibitions. But they never became the illustrations you know, for a specific uh, copy of the book. Uh, one of the things I think that's really important in looking at this earlier, his sense of his draftsmanship is, you know, impeccable. There's just no question whether you like looking at this kind of thing or not. The man could draw up a storm. The way he takes these things like these trees over here, it's hollowed out and yet it's corporeal, it's solid, the shading, you, you feel the weight of it, even though there's, you know, nothing in it. Uh, in my mind, Matisse has nothing on him in that regard. In the drawings, and in pretty much all his work, he really has, creates a world of its own. There's really almost, in very few cases, almost no ground in which they exist or background. There's, you know, there's no background, there's no ground. They're there, and yet you don't feel that they're unanchored. They're very solid even though there's nothing. This is the only one where it's just Dante and all the rest of them. It's Dante and Virgil, who's his guide through the Inferno. Next, please. <clears throat> Here are some more uh, cantos uh, being illustrated. Uh, he loves centaurs. They appear in his work throughout his career. And it's sort of interesting to try and understand and figure out what it is about the centaur. Is it <clears throat> the animal passions and the intellect of, of human beings that are combined? What are, I'm not a, a, exactly sure, but they do appear in many times. Um, this is just personally one of my favorites. Uh, the poignancy of that figure and just the incredible shading and modeling uh, of the form. The stories uh, in the cantos of the Inferno, I mean, they're very specific people uh, that are identified and would have been recognizable in early Renaissance times, uh, whether it's uh, nasty, bad popes, or rulers, or fornicators, or whatever, whatever, whatever. And when you read it, their expressions um, or the descriptions of them are very particularized. They're not in here. Most of it is, uh, makes them into types. And you see the, more the interest in seeing their suffering and what's happening to them rather than you know, their facial, who uh, they are uh, particularized. So you see here are both Dante and Virgil. Uh, Virgil is always just uh, barefoot in a toga. Uh, Dante is dressed uh, as an early Renaissance figure. Next, please. And the final one, um, that hurts. Um, we, we see what happens uh, uh, ultimately in the bottom circle of hell uh, among the damned. And then they go on um, to purgatory and to the people who are uh, caught up there. Next, please. But he also did these prints. And the prints, uh, one of the issues, and this is important, and it has to do with the career and marketing of this artist. When you hear prints, what do you think? You think of an edition. X number of prints made. And a little number, right? 14 slash 50, or some such thing. That there were 50 made, and this is number 14. He never editioned that which made it extremely hard for print dealers to sell his work. As, as far forward as the 1980s, I think, or maybe the 90s, I had a dealer from one of the major, major uh, art dealers in, in, the, in, the, in the world that had several branches uh, up at our house, and he 
looking, said, oh, I like this image. Uh, what's the addition? I said, there's no addition. I said, I can't sell it. I need to put an ad in Art International, give 10 to this person in Zurich, 10 to this person in Paris, 10 to my gallery in, in London. You know, if you have a one-off by a Picasso, a name that's already famous, I could just anyone be able to do it, but you, for a lesser known art. But he never did that. Every one of those uh, drawings, by the way, there was signed with an O.M. Most of his other print had no signatures. He signed almost every drawing <clears throat> and dated many of them, but not his completed works. So it's very difficult to, you know, when you have certain expectations. So these kinds of things are here, can I just say, the estate went through and stamped in and numbered everything. Yeah, they stamped the number on the back, but that's not the identifying thing on the fact that people are looking for right. a signature. That right. I'll, I'll get back to that, actually. So here, for example, and I forget which circle of hell this is, I'm sorry. Uh, Dante and Virgil are looking at these figures, and these kinds of prints, they, they can be several. And he'll make slight differences between them. And this is something he will do throughout his career. He will change the color in a hat head or a hat, or he'll uh, add you know, extra pieces to it. Uh, but he does a number of these uh, in different sizes also, black and white, uh, from, uh, the, from the Inferno uh, over the next X years in through most of the early uh, 1920s. Next, please. This too. So there'll be some of these that will have just black and white. Some the bodies will be colored. Sometimes the boat could be just outlined in black, but sometimes it's filled in. So again, this is working with a uh, linoleum block, or in some cases with those, but they again are all sort of individually done. Next, please. Okay. Related to some of the most dramatic things in uh, his work, in some of those most bizarre creatures, if you will, is a series that we refer to as his grotesques. That was just a name that was made up. And these grotesques could be found in drawings and in prints. Very few. It's a comparatively small body of work. They are based on reality in that we know he was in a hospital with a broken leg. I assume no matter how nasty the orderlies and nurses were, they weren't as bad as that. <laughs> Unless you didn't have good insurance, I guess. But seriously, uh, People, I've had any number of people, oh, uh, he must have been looking at Bosch. No, he's not looking at Bosch, because Bosch is very recognizable. If it's a bird that's doing something bizarre, it's a bird. They're not these created figures uh, that he does here. Looking at both, the, I think we're one of those, excuse me. Next, please. Do I have any more of those? Yes, I do. One more pair. And what do we have over here? Okay. So over there we have some of the grotesques. We have these figures on stilts. We have a number of them here, both prints and the drawings. And all of this kind of work probably owes some influence, and this is where we have to go back to the university uh, a minute. In the early 20s, uh, Hans Prinzhorn was at the medical school of the University of Heidelberg. As a junior physician, he'd already had degrees in art and art history before he went to medical school. You thought your kids were stretching out their education, right? I mean, that's really different. So, he got involved with the whole issue of the art of the insane. And he became the caretaker of and built up that whole collection.
section that is still at the University of Heidelberg, which uh, there was this film that uh, was shown the other night, both here, well, the other night down at Intuit and here a few weeks ago, and about Prinzhorn and that whole issue. Prinzhorn essentially is the grandfather of art therapy in the sense of looking at the art of the insane and so forth, and looking at untrained artists and, and all kinds of things that get into an interesting mix. But in addition, as a professor with the Psychiatric Institute, was interested in the uh, possibility of drugs in dealing with patients and in, to some extent, the simulation of things through what we call mind-bending drugs. And so he was running various experiments with his patients and one of those he was using, among other drugs, mescaline, peyote, essentially, and he needed a control group of none patienting, and Neumann became one of his control group. So we can't be sure how much of it all, some of this more fantastic stuff that you see in these, and in a sense reading back into the way he conceptualized the Inferno. I mean, the stories are there, but again, the kind of way he did it may indeed seem to be related to the possibility of those kinds of things with drugs. He also was somewhat of a depressive, and he took medications uh, throughout uh, his life of various kinds. But again, these fantastic, there's no accounting for these, you know, specifically. Otherwise, again, although there can be the germ of an, an issue uh, like uh, the uh, issue of <clears throat> the broken leg, but when you have a pile of skeletons leading a man, you know, off, like you have on that wall there, um, are some of these more fantastically created uh, figures. Again, all beautifully drawn. Um, there's something else. Next, please. This is, they, uh, he married Hilda in 29, January 29, and uh, a few months later, uh, they moved to Stuttgart, where they lived briefly. And they had their one child was born in November, I think it was, of 1929. Next, please. And there is the baby, Marianne, and there is Hilda uh, holding the baby. And he did tons and tons of drugs. He really seemed to have tremendous pleasure out of uh, the child and uh, many, many yeah, nice and warm drawings of both his wife and the child. Next, please. We also continue to look at the art of the past, and I just thought it would be interesting to show you some of the examples from his drawings of other artists. So, for example, you have <coughs> the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, uh, based uh, on Dura. Uh, this is based on Giotto. Um, often he says, right, so actually it's <laughs> nach Giotto, <but> after Giotto. <laughs> Uh, he does it, he can say El Greco, uh, various, various, uh, Renoir, and we have a lot of the drawings uh, still extant. Next, please. <clears throat> this is after one of the tapestry cartoons of Goya, the pottery vendor. We can see in this, by the way, though, he's investigating another kind of style, even though this is a sketch uh, of a well-known painting. It's uh, picking up more of a sort of post-impressionist uh, palette and, 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 and shape. And uh, this one, of course, not Greco. If you can conceptualize the El Greco at the top of the stairs at the Art Institute, it's one of two versions that is very, very much like that extremely long uh, drawn out figure of St. Uh, Mark. I won't say next, please, yet. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. I thought you were starting to choke up there. Maybe it was just the motion. The bread is emotional. All right. 
He also uh, dealt with other literary subjects besides the ones I mentioned, and some of them are sort of one-offs on things uh, from classical mythology, so, sort of like this uh, Daphne and Apollo, uh, you know, classic standard story uh, of classical mythology where he's about, uh, Apollo's going to go after Daphne and she prays to her father to stop uh, this rape and so it turns into a tree. Next please. He also got interested in African fairy tales. And uh, there was, of course, throughout the teen, well, actually, the teens, even the preteens, of maybe eight, 1906, seven through the 20s in France and Italy, a little bit, and specifically in France and Germany the most, there was an interest in African art. And what unfortunately was, you know, referred to as primitive art. And for a variety of reasons, and the, all kinds of new anthropological museums were opening up in cities, you know, in, in Europe and so forth. And he picks up an interest in these African fairy tales, which we really have not identified what they are, but a couple of them say Afrikanish, Afrikanish Martian, uh, eventually African fairy tales. <coughs> and I wanted to show you a couple of things. Uh, one of which is the stylistic difference. He does some, by the way, classic, it's drawing, there's his little O-N. The ones he does in pen and ink are very fluid and loosely drawn. Very, 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 very uh, and quite humorous often. Here's this turtle, an elephant, and not this one I call the boys in the van. I'm not sure exactly. It's like, he's, like it's like this rabbit's conducting, you know, from singing or something. Uh, and here's a family, uh, you know, tigers. Next, please. Oh, I thought I had one. Where do I have one? Up here of a drawing of those. Of um, the African fairy tales? Yes. Not just the pen and ink. Yeah, pen and yeah ink. there's a pen and ink group yeah. of, like, people. Yeah, well, so that's like these. But the drawings, take my word for it, are extremely tightly drawn, like those other uh, Dante things, instead of the fluidity that you find with the penny. So he changes the style based on the medium. Next, please. <clears throat> so they move, their final move is they move to Munich, the suburb of Munich, München Sohn, and that's where they live from 1933 till his death in 1975. She died, by the way, in 1970 of cancer there. And what was nice about this house that they bought with essentially Mama Rothschild's money was it had a big room on it that had been possibly a medical office or something like that, and it became a studio. So he had this very nice big studio stuck on to the house. Next week. There he is. Uh, in the 30s, dour-looking chap, usually. Next. Here's Marianne uh, at the age of probably four or to six years old. And his style, he has picked up, and we will see this in the next few works, he's starting to look at Cezanne. And you can see something of just the fragmentation of the, the treatment of the face. And they have just the, you know, more um, geometric aspects of it. Next, please. Self-portrait drawing. We just want to show you that here. Next. A still life. An oil painting. He does a very modest amount of oil paintings. We have one over in that corner there on the wall. Uh, he did some landscape, which, which is, again, very Cezanne-ish. Uh, <coughs> It's sort of lush. He does use the untouched aspects of white of the canvas as part of as one of the colors within it. And he, at this point, he actually does make a surface on uh, uh, which things sit. But even there, where's the difference between the background and that wall is very again something typical. We look at it, say 
Cezanne uh, of the, the very early 20th century. Next, please. <coughs> Watercolor and an oil of the same exact subject. We uh, had very many of those, but it was interesting. Next, please. It's still all in the mid-30s. And then, <clears throat> again, we have several of these landscapes. And I think those of you who know your Cezanne, you can see exactly how those trees uh, relate to that, as well as the geometry uh, of the architecture and the signature. Next, please. He also returns to religious subject matter. And he does a small number. We only have a few. We don't know if there were more. Uh, of scenes from the Passion of Christ, and here is the Christ before I, uh, the mocking, except in one of these suits of armor that's not appropriate. And he, he, he knew his history. He, why he does this, we don't know, because it's the same in the paintings and the drawings. Uh, it's inconsistent with the proper thing, but there's clearly that subject otherwise. And they actually are drawn, you know, like they have a frame, I mean, in a sense, and he conceptualized it very differently than he does with other things. Next, please. And he has a drawing for that subject, a uh, chalk drawing, and that's dated. Again, I tell you, he tends to more likely date a drawing than a completed work. He just really must have hated all historians. He really wanted to make it difficult for us. Next, please. Here's another scene from that. Again, Christ carrying the cross. But again, who is this mounted uh, figure in a, essentially what looks like a suit of armor? Next, please. Another of his religious subjects, and there's a, a three or four scenes from uh, St. Maria of Egypt. It's, that's, the, one. That's, the, that's the actual Block. plate from which it's Line made. Here's the linoleum block for that particular subject. Saint Marie of Egypt, not a very well-known saint, uh, someone who is a prostitute who comes to go to Jerusalem from somewhere and to receive communion, and she can't enter, and she realizes the way of her sins, and she goes off into the wilderness and dies there. And whatever. So, and this lion adopts her and protects her. And here she is at the end. The end there's three or four different scenes from her life. And he does it, he does St. Theodora to several not really you know, mainstream, top of the line, well known saints. But just and they're very again, very angular, sharp, and, and we call this kind of classic German expression. Next, please. <coughs> then he took on another big series, like the dot. Only these are prints, not drawings, although we have preparatory drawings for some of them. <clears throat> and we have a few of them over here, these two. Edward Munch had done a series in 19, I believe, 06, called Alpha and Omega. It was 22 works of a sort of an anti-creation story, anti-Eden story. And somewhere along the line, Neumann became aware of that and did his own, which he did in 14 plates. Starting with this, it sort of reminds of like a creation thing, but actually they're asleep on this island, he's asleep on this island, and she goes to tickle him or whatever and wakes him up. And I don't have all 14 here, again, I have them all in, in the book as well as the 34. Uh, Dante drawings, <coughs> they're, they're woodcuts. And, well, no, I don't know. And, but again, he shadows, shades it all uh, on the block. I think I have at least a couple more of these. Next, please. And they're very chummy, and they get along fine. And she gets involved with all these animals. And it's not just a snake, all different kinds of animals. Yes. Okay, yeah, there's another one. Do I have more? No, you go back to Af oh, African, or that's a drawing. No, this is a drawing for that subject. Mm -hmm. So again, notice it's a drawing, and then it's dated. It's just so bizarre that uh, actually telling you what month it's even done, but he does that, but again, complete 
work has no signature at all. Uh, and again, you can see that much more fluid drawing style that he is, which he tightens up when he does his completed works. Uh, and it says um, <clears throat> up there, uh, Alpha and Omega, again, based on Moon. Next, please. All right. Then the Nazis come to power. The, all this work has been of pretty much the late 20s through the 30s. <clears throat> and I think many of you know they have this big exhibition of degenerate art, and everything that's sort of modern is there. Neumann gets on the list for two reasons. One, the the art with the grotesques and everything was not something that showed Sonny Valkyrs uh, and nice blonde people uh, doing what they're supposed to, and also because he has a Jewish wife that he doesn't divorce. Next, please. And there he says, subtle, right? we get a self to make the book. They are annoying. And there's you know, he's on that list, and this thing is at the Victoria and Albert is probably the only surviving full, you know, list. How many other works on it? Do you remember, Keith? How many of us? There's over... Uh, well, it's it's over 600 pages of individual entries. Okay. So that doesn't include jazz, doesn't no. include... It's just the artists that were considered degenerate. <coughs> it's the artworks that were in German collections that were pulled out of those collections to go and destroy. Right. Except for the ones that Himmler and Goring wanted to keep for themselves. Right. More so. Right. Next, please. And, you know, very, being very good Germans, they kept very careful records. So, <laughs> later on, a, a lot of this was able to be identified. Next, please. But it's Neumann Nolden, which I think is really great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Drawing of Hilda, he's still attached in the late 30s to this more, uh, if you will, Cezanne-ish kind of treatment of the figure. But I, I think, hopefully not reading too much of it, those eyes seem to show that the times are tough. She, doesn't, she is not a happy camper there. And uh, things are closing in. Next, please. Oh, go back. I'm sorry. So what happens is this is when her family skedaddles. Uh, they go to the United States. They go to South America. They go to India. Uh, they go to England. And Hilda. And Otto stay there. They think about moving, get, getting out, but he's sort of slow moving and procrastinates. And by the time he thinks to go, it's too late to go. However, they're good friends, and I, a, I talk about this at great length in the book. I'm not going to spend time on it now, but they're friends who protected them. <coughs> All the Jewish people had to turn in their identity papers, and the women. Uh, were given, was it Sarah was the name stuck on to them, uh, if they were Jewish, and I think Isaac, if they were male, I don't honestly remember. Her papers went in saying Hilda Rothschild Neumann, Jew, came back saying Hilda Neumann, Protestant. Someone put in a fix. Interestingly, all the neighbors knew who she was, and no one turned her in. However, his sister threatened to turn him in. And that's a whole story I'm not going to get into, but they had to be very careful. <coughs> because Marianne uh, was, as a child, like 8 or 10 or 12, I forget, honestly, was riding a bicycle and was hit by a streetcar and suffered neurological damage and everything. And they had to be protective of her, and she sometimes disappeared and end up at her aunt's. And they didn't want to mess with her. This. At one time, they turned the house over to his sister, Epps, so that it wouldn't be confiscated, and she immediately went to put it on the market. 
the Neumann's neighbors and friends called the product said, do you feel safe in the house? You won't feel safe if you try and sell that. And they threatened it. <coughs> and they survived. After Marianne died, they didn't talk to her again. And she was living with a Nazi man. <coughs> so things got tight. And I can't show, there's nothing to show you because there's only some drawings. But at this point, uh, in the, after the Nazis were fully came to power, he obviously was not able to do much exhibiting, not with the whole list. And he'd already accumulated a nice collection of art of people he admired and liked and whatever. And he started selling off his art, whatever ways he could. And he eventually, when the University of uh, Munich's medical school was bombed, they moved this one division into his off, into his studio because he was doing drawings for them, anatomical drawings. You could see how he could draw like mad, plus his little bit of exposure to medical school. He was able, as with the scarcity of textbooks, to do neuroanatomical drawings. And he actually recounts it later on in life about the way he enjoyed it. He actually, the first time and only time in his life, he'd go be with you know, colleagues and go to lunch and stuff like that. He never had those kinds of relationships, being this sort of introverted uh, artist that he was. And after a while, even that didn't work, and they just closed down the school. And, oh, they flew off to Switzerland to a family meeting and went back in 1941. To, as incredible as that is, he said, if we all leave, the Nazis win. They survived, and just near the very end of the war, he got put in a camp, a low-security camp for unemployed people who were from it. They were supposed to be a work camp, but there was no work by then, only munitions, and there was nothing. They didn't have it. So at Christmas time, and he was not feeling when he was depressed, he asked to go home, they said, you can go back and then come back. He never went back, but by that time, the camps were closing, uh, the Allies were closing in, and that was the end. So the war is over. The rel her relatives, Hilda's relatives, who come to this country, by then had found, indeed, the streets were paved with gold, and were successful enough, they were able to start sending some money. The family had a chance to take back the department store, which had not been bombed. It's now called Krause's. For some strange reason, her brother and did not want to go back to Germany. But they worked out in a, a situation whereby they could get income based on gross sales from the Krause thing, which they still do to this day. The biggest thing is they own the parking lot next door, and it's the end of it pedestrian mall. That's the biggest thing they have going for them. They're not stupid. They never got rid of that parking garage. So, we go on to the post-war period. His style changes, and I'm not, again, time does not permit me to show you everything. He starts doing a lot of uh, interesting pastels. He never does an oil painting again. He pretty much never does a watercolor again. Pretty much the rest of his career is prints and drawings. Returns to mythological subjects, does a series of, from, of Odyssey, from the Odyssey, and here is the blinding of Polyphemus. The uh, Greeks uh, get the ogre. And his style, again, you notice there's no background, essentially no brown line. That's been consistent, these figures existing in space. And here, if you look, these are sort of continuous line drawings. Some of them will have literally one line for the whole figure, often two. Okay. And here's, a, here's one of the woodcuts from which this kind of thing is made. And um, so if you look at the face there, or just the legs, boom, boom, boom. Those lines go like that. See, do you see how they, sometimes they have a few lines, but again, they're often only one or two. Next, please. 
from the same series. And here, the blind, not blind, Polythemus is feeling to see what happened, of course, the Greek getting underneath the animals and Barrett Lit professors is there and how to get that, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, look at that head, just one line for the whole page. And notice the color is slightly different. What he starts doing <coughs> is creating uh, drawings and he presses on the back, because since they're making them one of a kind, he's pressing on the back to push away the inks uh, from the paper so you get the lighter areas. Next, please. Okay, there. Still mythological subjects uh, are there. He identifies that these are not you know, well-known stories in the same way, so he tells you the name of these mythological figures. And again, continuous line drawings. Next, please. Centers again, which we told you he And here it gets into things between like loving couples, and he has to, like nursing centaur and so forth. Next. Then we have other, we assume are mythological ones, and here's two from we have no idea. No one I've ever um, has been able to identify what the story is behind it, uh, who they are, whatever. Uh, again, but this is graphite drawings, incredible uh, detail, and modeling. Next. There's some pastels. Next, please. And again, his, uh, here's a woodcut, and there's the continuous line going, and the next one, please. It's essentially the same figure, but he just changes the head and print, I mean, it will print it in different colors, even if it's on a woodcut. Next and a drawing for it. And there you can really see how that whole thing, that whole face is, you know, one continuous line. Next. <clears throat> the figures get more and more abstract through the mid-50s when these are from, all the way to the early 60s. Next. More elongated, more rounded sometimes. Uh, he's not a rich colorist in general, but he gets subtle relationships in those colors. Patterns. Next. And Hilda, who studied weaving as well as piano when she was young, started doing tapestries based on his works. And they're really exact, as we have one pair hanging. I said, oh, I found the, the work it's based on, and no, it wasn't. It was almost, then I saw the others. Yes, there it is. They're exactly based. They're very tightly woven. Uh, it's about, the, 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 the his piece is about Oh, this tall. Hers is about five feet tall. Four feet, four and a half. This is the one I was talking about that we had. And the book I show you an alternative uh, thing for that. Again, extremely tightly woven. And she probably did about 40 or 50 of which this 25 uh, extent. Uh, but the others were probably sold. Next. Oh, that's the other one. Do you want to just quickly go back and see the slight difference? And it's in the genital area, actually. Next, yeah. Next, please. Here he is, sort of showing for on command how he does uh, his prints, and there he, we see him uh, in the studio with his current work. He never wanted to show his early work, but he's not alone as an artist in feeling I'm, I've got it now. This is what's important. If were it not for his wife, he would have thrown away the whole his first pre-war period. She kept them all in storage, and luckily. The family started in the middle of the three nephews inherited, started going in the 60s, getting interested in starting to show the work and uh, get some American dealers and exhibitions and so forth. Next, please. The abstraction gets more and more. I just sort of love this way this, I sort of call it the kiss, but it's, you know, uh, again, continuous line drawing and tightly moving into space. Next. And some of them then get where he starts fragmenting things. This is what I call sort of the late Paul Clay art period. And then one more, please, of those. Oh, that's one of his, again, her weaving based on his print. And more and more he, he fragments these things. And then we move into his last phase, which is these figures, which if you've seen them and nothing else, you say, oh, just totally non-objective art. But I hope you can all see how these come out of his 
attachment to the human figure existing solidly in space. And we've got a couple of these. Next, please. Various colors, different shapes, tones of color come from the overlapping, you know. And these are all done on glass plates. He actually could have lit one piece of glass because he just cleans it off and does something. Works in the back, he does not work with a printing press. After he stops doing the woodcuts, I'll know that there's no press, it's only a sheets, putting on the inks, putting down the paper, working from the back. He used a tongue depressor, actually, we know, as part of pressing down to push away as well as his thumbs. And next, please. Drawing, so it's stated. A drawing for those abstracts. Again, the abstracts might have a year. These give you a very tight date. And this is the end. I think I have one more, maybe. And one more. 1970s. <coughs> Next. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? I do. I do. Actually, it brought up an uh, outlet area, um, which is so the decision to leave or not to leave. Um, the family places that on Otto, or you know, was it was there any rational <clears throat> decision making? And then the other thing is, what is your and, and, and because there's really not evidence. This is clearly you have to make suppositions, but your supposition about his mental health and and his position in terms of that. Is well, again, he was. Essentially, somewhat of a depressive throughout his period, throughout his life. He did in the uh, 60s. Uh, he also would try all kinds of um, naturalistic medicines and so forth. At one point, um, he uh, had a doctor who she came and gave him vitamin injections. He, he did that. Uh, in the early 60s, he was went to a uh, <clears throat> homeopathic sanatorium called Alabama, <coughs> and he did very tiny figures. Now, this all on the same size sheets as all the rest of them. He just did them, but they were the same kind of imagery, but just very, very tiny. Again, <clears throat> we do know he was you know, taking all kinds of medication throughout his career. We all we do know. Uh, that he was not a very loquacious person. He would, various people would talk about how his opinions, when ventured, would be um, interesting and mostly about world affairs and looking at political realities. He didn't talk much about aesthetics or art. Um, whether how much it was his decision about staying again best we have from some modest records are that he wasn't getting his act together quickly. He was not alone, certainly, among zillions of other people there who also went, oh, if this can't get worse, or this is just a phase, or, you know, I mean, unfortunately, the, the camps and the crematory were filled with people who thought nothing much more was going to happen if they seen the worst. So it's hard to say, blame him. <clears throat> Maybe they sat and discussed it together. I, I don't know. Again, our friend, the, the uh, business folks took off. Clearly, he didn't. <clears throat> she stayed there. She died in 1970 of cancer. After which, uh, he was more than slightly depressed. But then he went into a burst of activity. And a lot of those late abstracts are done between 71 71. 70, 70, 71, he did a, a lot of them. But then, he stopped completely. He had this friend, Gerhard Evers, who, an art historian, who was his life woman, who wanted to do a book on him. Again, there's all kinds of things I didn't have time to discuss, but uh, Evers had divorced his Jewish wife. Evers published a book on Rubens in 1942 in Munich. Clearly, he was no strident critic of the regime, or he couldn't have pulled out. At the end, apparently, Norman said, you know what? I don't want you to do a book on you, you, you didn't do it like that. So there's all kinds of intricacies. And you know, who knows if one's in a situation like that, how one would act. 
So we have a lot of information. Avery's had a big chunk of that book already done, which uh, we have, and which we've had translated into English. And I used a lot of it, and I you know, put note of things from him, and they were friends uh, for you know, 40, 50 years. So met him, and we had our exhibition in Heidelberg in 82, I think it was, at the Kunstverein in Heidelberg. And he was there between his two wives, his first Jewish wife, who in uh, Switzerland, really, and the same. We didn't say, uh, me, lady, why are you with this man? But we didn't. It's not about business. And he was seen out there anyhow. But Abel and his second wife, his Aryan wife. And there, there were other friends. They had a good friend, this artist, uh, this uh, author, Werner Bergenblum. <clears throat> he was a poet, and some of the works are based on his <coughs> poetry and novels. And uh, they were good friends, and they lived with them for a while when Bergen Green's house was destroyed. So they, they had good relations. He actually had some students. After Marianne died, now she committed suicide in like, the age of 20 or something with, with a love. Just to clarify, the daughter who had been injured. Yeah, that's in Marianne. Um, committed suicide. And he sort of semi adopted, you know. It was nice to be a lot of these other young women became substitutes, sort of. Questions? Yes, sir. Did he have a dealer? I mean, he didn't was he always have, actively he trying to promote himself? Until World War One, excuse me, World War Two, and then he, he didn't have. need a dealer, and that's when he did participate in exhibitions. He had, he did participate in exhibitions. After the war, uh, not much was going on for a while, but one of the, the middle of the three nephews, who went back and forth there because he was an academic and had the summons free and would go there, he brought work back and he got there, a dealer in Houston very briefly. Uh, there was a dealer in um, Ann Arbor, which is where the, the nephew taught, and they found this deal. And I have the name of it in the book somewhere, I'm just not remembering it. Forsyth Theater, yeah, for, Forsyth Gallery. And a lot of them just you know, turned over and went, and he was in a lot of exhibitions, and I, I, I talk about it and we illustrate, <coughs> I think there's a catalog down, I don't have them here, but down at the other exhibition, uh, some of these exhibitions, uh, and he worked with young artists he did, he and did poets. He would illustrate magazines. Yeah, yeah chapbooks almost. Of yeah. contemporary poetry and yeah. writing. Little things. magazines, we call them today, probably. And so there'd be one of them, more than one, there'd be illustrations in there of his works that are unattended. Here's a poem by so and so, here's a print by Norman, and one of them is right on the cover. It's, it's at least one. We don't have a full set of them. So he, uh, and then there were various dealers at various times, and there was an early dealer that we got when I got involved in Chicago, who was doing very fine until her husband got a job as the uh, managing editor of the San Francisco Chronicle, and they went off there. So he wasn't really interested or, yeah. or motivated. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I was. He wasn't motivated. He's so talented. How is this guy so much more famous than he is? And you know, this, this is world this, famous. This is this really interesting issue from my point of view, which is, uh, and something that David and the, and the estate have struggled with, you know, now for 40 years, which is the German Expressionists who were working during that period were exhibiting internationally, and they're part of the literature as you go along. How do you, you know, begin to insert somebody into, into that literature? He was known by other artists. I actually, one, at one point, in, I think it was 1963, there was a letter from someone else, oh, I understand Brock is coming to see you. Well, you can't, I can't see you because Brock is going to be there. Well, we don't know if Brock ever got there because Brock died somewhere around that point. But he was known and that some other artist is writing to him about Brock is going to be with him. He was in other exhibitions. And again, people want to put on retrospectives, send some work. He sometimes wouldn't send it. He, he again, you know, sort of his own worst enemy, certainly was not a marketing profession. He, he didn't give a shit. 
You know, That's a more genteel way of talking. <laughs> yeah, he didn't care. Thank you for that insight, Keith. Yeah, no, 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 he did. I mean, he cared, but it had. He wasn't going to say. There was an artist. I mean, a poet who was, was interested in having him do illustrations or include his work with his poetry. And he, I mean, he had a lot of principles. He said, "Well, I, I like you, and I please send me the poem, so I'll see if they fit." And he wrote back, said, "They're very interesting poems, but my work doesn't fit with those, and I pass." He wouldn't send it, and they would have been published in the book. So then he wasn't a self-promoter in, no, in any way. Not by Arf Ducky, no. Yeah, okay. And clearly there are resources from Hilda's family and probably from his as well that allowed them to have a comfortable life. And, and or my, perce in my perception, I don't know if David would agree, is that he is somebody who's suffering from <clears throat> post-traumatic stress disorder. He's, you know, he's a introvert. There are no smiling photographs of him, even in situations that uh, your the affect would you would expect someone to pretend to be smiling. There, there's not a single smiling photograph. It's trauma after trauma after trauma. Look at the work. I mean, it's, like, it's, it's incredibly. It could be whimsical. That's the best. It's not whimsical and humorous, but not joyful. Yeah, maybe that's also why he didn't do anything with Harley. So, right. <clears throat> Yeah. No, he focuses on unredeeming punishment. <laughs> you know, I have, you know, here, here we have uh, purgatory, which at least you have a chance of getting out, right? But his focus is on, it, his focus is on two things. Um, the form of the body, first of all, is really central to what he is doing. And it's it's, I wouldn't say it's dysmorphic, but it ranges from a classic kind of mass. David would stop me if you disagree. You know, he's looking at classical bases. He's looking at um, the way that you know the Byzantine and the medieval period represent the body, and then he moves on. And you look at the studies, and it's about you know sort of a you know, just the beauty of the mass of the body. And that's a, that's the, almost the constant theme that I see. Certainly, very interested in <clears throat> the potential of the inherent, you know, form and the muscles that can spring forward. It doesn't show you in action mostly, but the potential and so forth. I'll show you a sketchbook. Anyone who's interested, out of the archives from the war period when he's like most economical with pages, and it's just hey, he's filling the sketchbooks page after page after page. With register after register of sort of the same kind of movements and motion you know, and the form of the body. Basically. There's there, there's actually four pages from the sketchbook from the war period there on the wall. Any other questions? Okay, again, thank you for your patience. And, um...